Hello, hello from my side as well. So my name is Juho. I work in engineering of Smartly. I actually used to work as an account manager before joining the engineering team, and I'm also working in the managed services that we are right now building up. And today I was going to talk about automation and especially about how to utilize automation to scale your advertising up. Uh, as Erno mentioned, I've been working with quite quite a few quite big advertisers, spending multiple millions on uh, on monthly basis, and I've also seen like small scale spenders go to that class. So there's a couple of learnings that I've I've had from around the globe and all over these years. But let's get started. So let's start with a brief story. So this is John. Maybe I should have named him Johan now that we are here in Stockholm. But he's an awesome online adver advertising manager. He does pretty much everything that one would like expect from online advertising manager. He pauses all the bad performing ads, he tweaks the budgets, he all the time keeps changing the beats to figure out where does he get the most optimal CPM. And this is really taking his full working day. And he's doing actually a pretty, pretty good job there and getting good results. But maybe there could be actually something that he could actually do instead of all this. Because if he's spending time to change budgets, tweak targetings, and micromanage every aspect of each individual campaign, where he, what he isn't doing is actually thinking about on the higher level what they should be advertising, thinking about creatives, thinking about targeting that would help them to get the next one million users for their platform on next million conversions. So there's one thing that like helps when, when like you think if you should hire more people to your team to continue doing this micromanagement, but there's a couple of simple rules that actually ease up your workload quite a bit. And the first and foremost is splitting audiences is usually a bad idea. This is really usual to do on Facebook because initially when Facebook started, pretty much the Facebook marketing pitch was that you can target so granularly. But nowadays, after a couple of years, Facebook has doing an awesome job with their product development. Most of the time, you actually shouldn't be splitting those audiences. Also, sounds simple, but keep everything as simple as possible because it's really easy to start building complex setup. It can fulfill you, yourself that, okay, right now I'm managing this 200 campaign setup and it's bringing good results. Most likely you could minimize the amount of campaigns, minimize the amount of ads, and save a lot of time to spend where it actually matters. So try to keep always things simple. The largest advertisers I've seen are using simpler setups than the smaller ones. And also, don't test everything. Although we at Smartly, at Facebook, people always say that you should be testing everything. Testing actually isn't free. So you, you need to always, always think what you should be testing, what are the most important questions you want answers to, and test that. But don't consume your budget, don't consume your energy to test everything. And one thing, just as a starter, so computers are actually pretty good at doing this kind of like manual tasks, changing budgets and targetings and whatever. So let them do that so that you can actually concentrate on something that's more important that computers at least today cannot yet do. But now, most likely you have been thinking about marketing automation. It's a huge buzzword there. You are, you are thinking you need to invest huge amounts of money into building develop, developer teams to build your machine learning systems. But actually you don't. Because Facebook, in the end, as said, they are developing their systems uh, with amazing speed. And if we think how Facebook make, makes their money, and it's pretty much monetizing users. And if you think uh, how the like, revenue from one user has been growing from time to time, uh, we see that it's growing quite a bit. And is that because they are showing more ads to each individual user? No they're actually showing less and less ads for each individual user based on some analysts. And what is then happening is that they are able to target your ads better and better and that way increase your conversion rates. And that way they can show less ads but make more money. Sounds pretty good. Also, one thing that people always think that, okay, you know your customers the best. Most likely you don't. Facebook knows them even better. Facebook knows yourself even better than most likely you do. 
they have so much information about user behavior, where do people uh, shop and so on, that they can really use a lot of that information to optimize your ad delivery, that you don't even have access to this kind of information. But what would you need to then do to actually get like full gains of whole Facebook ecosystem and the optimization capabilities that are already now good and they are every day they are getting better better there's three things I'm talking about today so one is using large audiences as I mentioned splitting audiences is usually a bad idea then the second one is bidding boldly most of the issues I've seen uh, with customers having for example delivery issues um, many times all of bad performance are coming from the fact that they are not bidding boldly enough. And there's huge gap between, for example, Google and Facebook, where Google bid is really, really important when you do your daily optimizations. Uh, when I'm running the managed services campaigns, I'm not even touching the bid. Maybe on once a week I might do something, but most of the time bid is actually not even interesting to me. And the third thing is to automate as much as possible so that you can again think on a higher level, think where you can actually find the next, next one million users. But let's start with the audiences. And as said, think first before going to granular. There are still reasons that cause you to split uh, your audiences and that's not bad, but you should always be thinking like what they are. And like the most important is that if you have audience specific creatives, let's say you have different languages or you're, uh, you're doing localized creatives, for example, each individual, for each individual city and you have a city name and a creative. Okay, you need to target each individual city then. Or there's huge difference between LTV expectations between, for example, men and women. Most likely you then want to have them in different assets so that you can bid according to the LTV expectations. Also, you might want to gain more learnings about your audience than what Facebook is able to provide afterwards. Facebook can tell you about like age, gender, placement and so on. But apart from that, for example, if you want to know from which custom audience did the conversion come from, you cannot do that unless you split your audiences into buckets. And for, fourth, if you're, for example, using GA, or some other third-party metrics platform, you may, may want to have like different UTM tags for each individual audience. And that, again, causes you to break, break those up. But one thing you should remember is that most likely you are hurting your performance when splitting those up. So measuring is not free. So always think, is the information about from which custom audience the user came so important to you that you actually want to cause down, uh, like decrease in your performance in order to get that information. So it's always a trade-off. You, sh you should think there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just saying usually splitting audiences is a bad idea, but you need to always think what are the insights you want to gain if you can actually gain more, more performance by using, for example, highly targeted creatives, then it most likely makes sense. But this is a good testing, testing scenario. This is something that most likely you want to test at some point, that if you remove targeting, what happens? Then about bidding boldly, uh, Lauri will be also talking a lot about optimization and how, the, how bid optimization works there. So we are actually going through this pretty quickly, but this is the usual thing that everybody who's working with Facebook is saying, bid your true value. That's pretty much the game theoretical model that comes out of like the, comes out, but unfortunately that's just not so easy. Most of the time you need to increase your bid above your true value in order to get delivery. And Facebook is still ensuring that you get the cheapest conversions, but with your like true value, it's really hard to usually get delivery. And then you just adjust the bid according to the real results. And one thing about bidding and budgeting, this is something uh, when especially working as an account manager, I had big discussions with customers about like, what's your goal? And usually the answer is like, spend 10K a day with five, $5 CPA. But there's actually a problem with this kind of like uh, goal setting. This is not the worst example, but I think it's a pretty good example, is that it's still kind of vague. So what would you do actually if your CPA is lower than five, would you be able to increase the budget? Are you ready to do that? Or like, what if it's above five? It won't be exactly five in any case. So what do you do? 
do you still want to spend the 10k? Do you want to stop completely? Do you want to decrease your budget? So you should always be thinking about this, especially when you think about automation. And pretty much here, so this can be broken down into two separate goals. And like with all the like goal setting, uh, I always like to use linear programming as an example. So whenever you are thinking about your goals, you should have one value that you are trying to maximize or minimize, be it CPA, be it revenue, and then you treat everything else as a constraint. So for example, get me as many conversions as possible while CPA stays, stays below five. That would be actually a pretty good goal already. And there's a couple of issues with this kind of like, uh, if CPA stays below something, uh, we call them CPA or bit constraint campaigns. Uh, there's a couple of issues that may arise. So if you want to spend as much as possible while maintaining under $5 CPA, is that then if you just bid $5, your realized CPA will be lower than that because the maximum price Facebook is then going to offer you for one conversion is five. So you will end up lower than that. And if it's like a really, really strict goal for you, it may cause delivery issues. And delivery issues is again something that you most likely don't want to experience. So there's a couple, couple of things to take into account here. So many times then customers ask that what to do when the CPA is not on the right, right level. There's one really good thing is to use average bidding. Many times you are actually interested in average bid, uh, sorry, average CPA instead of like maximum CPA. If you want to have like five, five as the average CPA, that works usually pretty well. And also you can of course scale down, down up. If you notice that okay, your real CPA is much lower than your goal, and you want to spend more, okay, just increase it. Even though it would be like three times your true value, just increase it, it doesn't matter. What matters is the realized CPA. Focus on that, not the bid. The bid is just an arbitrary value. And also, use the conversion window setting Facebook is right now offering. So if you know that, for example, after sign up, uh, people won't be purchasing immediately, and you're bidding towards sign up, you want to use, for example, seven day or even 28 day conversion window in bidding so that Facebook knows that most of the conversions won't be happening immediately during the one day, but then they can optimize using longer conversion windows. Helps a lot with this kind of cases. When using average bidding, uh, then Facebook tries to give you as many conversions while maintaining your average on, on the level that you have defined. From my experience, it's still quite conservative. So if you're working with products where the LTV is, let's say, $500, average bidding is going to be way too conservative for you because most likely you would actually like to bid around like $1,000 or something like that. There's an example I will be going through uh, with one of my cu old customers that if you want aggressive delivery, average bidding is not going to cut it. You need to manually bid even higher. And other thing that happens usually with the like, CPA constraint campaigns is that you bid initially too low. Really common issue that I've, I've seen with the customers. And that kind of causes a vicious circle. So if you bid too low, it means that, okay, your CP, realized CPA will be going above your bid. Facebook notices that, okay, we're not getting results to you. Facebook doesn't want to destroy your budget. They start downscaling the campaign pretty much immediately when they notice that the real CPA would be higher than your bid. Okay, less conversions, again, higher CPA, less learnings, and it causes this circle that pretty much you cannot get out of it. If this happens to you, don't try to like get the campaign alive anymore. Just pause it, clone it, restart with the higher bid. It's really, really tough situation to actually get out of. Then the other way around, if you're budget constrained, this is when you start to automate, I think this is usually easier approach uh, to managing your bid and budget. And this just means that you pretty much bid as high as possible. Of course, set some kind of a limit there so that you won't be like coming to work next day and you find out that you just paid $1,000 per conversion. So keep it sensible, but keep it aggressive. But how, how do you then make sure that you're getting the cheapest conversions? Facebook does that for you. So essentially when you, when you start to use that kind of a strategy, Facebook will always learn where does it find the cheapest conversions for, for you. It doesn't happen during the first day. It might even not happen during the next day. For example, one case I, I recently worked with uh, was about that we, we actually simplified 
customer strategy quite a bit. And right now we are not actually using even, even targeting there anymore. And it took roughly a week, even like almost two weeks. And like the CPA just went up, up, up. But after that, Facebook starts learning. The CPA started to come down. It started to stabilize. And right now we are well below of what the customer actually used to have when they micromanage the campaigns. The workload that we are right now using is much less. Right now, pretty much one, one guy could manage a couple of those kind of customers alone. So, and those budgets are like multi-million. So simplifying pays usually off, but it also means that you need to be patient enough to wait that Facebook learns. It's a machine learning, learning algorithm in the end. But then if we go to the third topic, which is the most important topic, which is the automation I came to talk about. So then let's move back to the goal setting because computers are actually amazingly stupid machines. They don't think, they don't have common sense. So when you start to think that you want to automate something, make sure that you know your goals really, really well. Because you need to tell the computer your goals exactly. Or if you just tell the computer some vague goals, you get vague results, most like really, really bad results, or like you end up maximizing spend while minimizing, uh, <laughs> minimizing ROI or something like that. Make sure that your goals are clear. Before that, please don't try automating. You're just automating wrong workflows and most likely you don't want that. Then a couple of things I've noticed. Uh, usually when I work with customers, I try to make them to automate as much as possible using different kinds of platforms. But one issue, or not, not maybe issue, uh, but one thing I've, I've noticed is that many times it's really hard for people to actually change their work, workflows. Old habits, habits die hard and when you start to automate, Many people feel that they're actually losing control. If they are letting actually computer to decide what is the budget for this audience and when should this creative be on and when it should be off, many people start to actually feel that, okay, what am I doing here? I used to actually be in control of this. This computer made a decision that is actually like in conflict of what I would have done. So it's an issue. But in a sense, these computers still, because they, if they are given the right instructions towards what to optimize, they are usually actually making better decisions in the end that humans would be able to do. They also do them in the middle of the night during the weekends. They don't need holidays. So you just need to let them do their work. And of course, tweak the goals, tweak the ways of working. But also what it means is that you start, need to start thinking on a bit higher level. So. It's really easy in the online advertising world to make yourself like really, really busy. You, as I said, you tweak all the budgets, you do all the minor things, but in the end, you might be optimizing, for example, increasing like revenue from one ad by 5%. But if you're working with 10,000 active ads, well, there's not enough time in the, in the world that you would be able to go through them in a timely manner. And then you still might be end, end, end up optimizing that one ad. But if you're working with huge setup, your goal is to scale. Most likely you don't want to like increase one ad performance 5%, but if you would be able to actually increase the whole like ad accounts or portfolios performance by 3%, in absolute figures that would be a lot better result than focusing on one single issue. Let computers do their work. They will pause if you tell them to. They will pause the like, bad performing ads and so on. And this allows you to focus on something else. Creatives is still most likely the like, performance driver number one. You need to think about having different styles of creatives. Think like which creatives resonate on, on which season and so on. Think about the next audiences because by tweaking bid or budget, you may have like plus minus 20% in CPA. By finding new audiences, new creatives, we are talking in multiples. So if you need to scale up, don't waste your time thinking about some bid strategy or something like that, or you can scale up 20%. You're not ever going to scale up like 20,000%. It's happened somewhere else. And getting to the scale, as said, I've been also seeing quite a few cases where small players become really, really big players. And what that requires, again, is to understand that even though everybody competes in the same ad auction, 
small players and big players behave quite differently. Because if you are, for example, a global brand, you most likely don't want to target two individually. You want to reach everybody in this world. A couple of our customers, uh, when, I, when I used to work in the United States, and we, we started like, asking questions, that who, who do you want to target? Like, who's your target audience? The whole United States. That's it. There's no targeting happening anymore. You're working with big, big budgets, big audiences, and the same in like, Nordics. It doesn't mean that you need to be in multi-million scale, but if you want to scale up from like, having $10,000 monthly budget to, let's say, 100000 it requires you to start to think like these bigger competitors do. And also, one thing I noticed also by myself is that when you start to work with these bigger budget, bigger audiences, many things you used to do are actually going away. You won't be anymore like tweaking the targetings because many times there's no targeting to tweak. You are targeting the whole country or even like really, really large lookalike. With the bid, well, you're most likely just bidding high enough to get enough delivery and then you're controlling everything by budget. So what you should be then doing is, again, think about creatives, think about, for example, if, if there still could be some like, tiny audience that you haven't, haven't yet known. And, but with the targetings, we did a test uh, like a while ago uh, with one mobile app-based company, and we tested how did lookalikes and no targeting perform against each other. What was really interesting is lookalikes is still my number one answer to when customers ask, like, what kind of targeting should I be using? It's lookalike. But when we actually ran this test, uh, it's good to notice that these guys were like one of those who say that the whole world is their market. So this won't be working for everyone, but as an example, with the lookalike from their existing users and without any targeting, just the whole country, the CPA was pretty much exactly the same. No, no big difference there. But the broad audience was able to deliver 3.5 times the conversions than the lookalike with the same CPA and without any hassle of modifying the targetings. So this is, I think, one of the greatest examples of like, how can you actually improve your result by going to simpler direction, not towards more complex setups. And I've also seen big companies that try to do like really, really complex setups and try to use these like growth hacker techniques. I think the funniest one that I've heard uh, during the last couple of weeks was that the campaign performs the best when it's launched the fourth time. So I started thinking maybe we should build a feature that launches campaigns four times. <laughs> might, be, might be good, but in the end, you most likely don't want to chase those. It might be true. Uh, Lauri will, will most likely also explain why that might be might be actually working, I believe it's working, but those change. And if you want to build scalable and long, long running campaigns that work from week to week, from year to year, it's pretty much a waste of time trying to find these like anomalies that might exist for one month after which Facebook changes something and they don't work anymore. If you're a growth hacker working on minimal budgets and you're like, goal is to figure out these kind of the tricks by all means, do that, but if your plan is to build scalable advertising, don't. And as I mentioned, uh, I will talk about one example here, uh, BarkBox. I used to work with them as a US-based company selling dog treats as a subscription service. And when we started to work with them, they pretty much every weekend, they were up, up on the business manager managing all the aspects of the campaigns. And what they are right now doing after they started to use us is that they manage everything using automation rules. So instead of going to individual campaign, pausing something, what they do is they create sets of rules that pause ads, increase budgets, change bits, and so on. And when they want to test something new, they change the rules, not the campaigns. And well, I can say that they have a really, really small team compared to the, like, amount of stuff that they are doing, and that is possible because they automate everything that they can. So as a last thing here, a uh, couple of like, ideas what to automate. Everything is, of course, automatable when we are working with computers, but every regular action, changing bits, pausing something, creative, like you can, you can rotate creatives automatically, not too hard. Campaign creation, if that's your like, pain point, do that. If, if it isn't your pain point, you don't want most likely automate campaign creation. Audience selection, 
creative production. And these are just some ideas what you can automate. Think what's the biggest pain point for you and take it from there. Thank you. These are the three things. If something you get out of these presentations, please take these. I think these are pretty good rules. And if like all customers understand this, I would be really happy. And did we have some questions? Yes, we do. Thank you, Juho. And thank you all for the questions. We have them in, in the slider. You can check them there. So uh, the topmost question is, uh, what do you think about splitting mobile slash desktop on at a level? Uh, this is a really good question. It depends, again, if you are having different LTV expectations for people coming from mobile coming for coming from desktop. If you don't, don't split them, because what happens then is if they're on the same ad set, Facebook is able to learn cross-placement. All ad sets on Facebook learn independently. So then you are getting more conversions to that ad set. You're feeding the optimiz optimization algorithm more. It will get more efficient, and it will be able to figure out how users behave across different plat platforms. So again, if no, no different creatives, if no difference in LTV, don't split them. Thank you. Uh, the next top one is the, when do you recommend using automatic bidding versus manual bidding in general? And the advantage and disadvantage yeah. of both. Automatic bidding, uh, usually I don't recommend too much of using that, but it's a good starting point if you don't know, for example, your LTV expectation, or you don't know uh, how aggressive you should be in this audience. Then it can be a really good tool to like test the eyes, what's happening there, but after you start to like gather knowledge on like, okay, how the audience behaves, what's your LTV, most likely you want to use manual bid. Uh, sometimes it's just because automatic bid is not aggressive enough. It doesn't, for example, work too well if your like LTV expectation is $500. It works if it's like less than that, but with like really harsh LTVs, you need to bid always manually. And anyhow, I wouldn't like lose that lever. Even though I'm saying like you shouldn't be changing bids too often, but still I think it's really good to have that option available when needed. But if you don't know your LTV and you want to test something, automatic bid is a good choice then. Quick question, we have some seconds left. Uh, how can I have full control of frequency? Uh, full control of frequency. First question, uh, if this would be a real situation, please come talk to me after, is that why you want to be in full control of frequency? Uh, that would be what I would ask like first and foremost, uh, but then of course you can use different like objectives on Facebook. For example, brand awareness allows you to set frequency caps on the campaigns, or you can use automated rules. For example, pause as if frequency hits five. But the first question would be why you want to be in full control of that. If you don't have data about optimal frequency, we've been trying to fig figure that out. Still, we haven't. Why would you need to be in full control? But please come talk to me after this. That's a really interesting topic. Thank you. Thank you.